Good evening. This lecture is Leilu Nishmat Shai Liael Bat Moran, Israel Bet Binyamin, Ketura Bat Sara, Shirina Bat Lea, Adir Israel Malul Ben Rivka. And Atzacha Daniel Ben Susan Kalen, Atzacha also לרפואה שלמה אוף זבולון, סינגסון בן שרה. ברוך השם, it's 4th in July today, people ask me, what, you're going to give a lecture? You know how much traffic you're going to have from upstate to come, usually that's the way it is. I said, you know, I don't cancel lectures because of American holidays. We always do. Even when there was Super Bowl, they say, you, what, you're going to give a lecture on the Super Bowl? No one would come. The, the fact that people ask such a question, it's very disturbing. Why? So it's the Torah is under the, the culture of the Goim. The Goim has their own ideas, I don't know, football, this, that, a picnic, barbecue, whatever they made up. And all of a sudden, the Torah became secondary. What kind of education it gives to the Jewish uh, followers of the Torah, that there are things that are more important that you should cancel a Shi'ur Torah. So, Baruch Hashem, those of you who came today, they get the reward for those who didn't come as well, which is very good. Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul used to learn on Friday, mamash until Shabbat. They ask him, why are you learning now? Now it's everybody prepared for Shabbat, going to shul. It's almost Shabbat. He's sitting learning. Every Friday he finished the whole Masechet from morning to night. The whole Masechet of my world takes us months. He finished in a day. So he say the reason he learns on Friday, Mamash, until Shabbat, because that's the time that the world doesn't learn. And then someone sits and learns when nobody else sits and learns, he gets the credit for everybody get special credit, so we should know about that. It's very important. So the lectures are always going as usual, Baruch Hashem. And uh, before I start to speak about Korach and the famous story and how does it affect us today and what can we learn from it today, you know, it reminded me that there was one rabbi that his daughter got married. And they said to the student, tomorrow I won't be able to come. Why? Because my daughter got married in Nebrak. So I would like you to go over what we learned together. But don't cancel. Come, as usual. Instead of me teaching all of you, you learn together. Chevrutot. So only tomorrow. That's it. So, they, the next day, they see he showed up. Dress, nice, suit. What happened? You say, not coming. He say, yes. The plan was that now I was supposed to be in a chupa of my daughter. The problem is that the rabbi that is Mesader Kiddushin came out late. And until they're going to sit and do everything, it won't start before... The shiur. So why should I lose? Why should I lose an hour of Torah? So I quickly I left the hall. It's few blocks away. I ran here. I'll do the shiur and I come right to the chupa of his own daughter. Why? Because he understood the value of an hour of Torah. The value of an hour of Torah, besides the sixty thousand mitzvot that you get when you learn an hour of Torah, it's important. It's important to make it routine. Not just an hour here, an hour there, two hours here, two hours there. No. The question that Hashem asks every Jew when he dies, not if you learn Torah. Kavata itim la Torah. Did you make specific times every day to learn Torah? Well, well, who cares if I learn in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening? One day I learn in the morning, the next day I learn at night. The following day I learn in the afternoon, I change the hours based on, uh, you know, whatever the job is. Why does it have to be set time? Set times to learn Torah. 
Because when something is important for you, you make time for it in your schedule. Just like uh, lunch break, you know, you need to eat, you're gonna be hungry by then. So you set up time. It's not just random, one time here, one time there. When it's random, that means it's not so important. But when you set it up as the priority in my life, and then everything else is secondary. I have to make money, I have to do business, I have to do other things, errands. All of that is fine, it's no problem. The question is, what was the priority for you? The Torah or Fourth and July barbecue? The Torah or birthday party? The Torah or fireworks? Fireworks, some places today, people are gonna get so excited, they see some lights in the sky. What's the big deal? It's like the first time you saw fireworks. Why people get so excited? I don't know. But, you know, people sometimes look more for an excuse not to come. When they can't find an excuse, no, they force themselves to show up. So, Baruch Hashem, uh, we get the idea. And uh, if you know, last week there was no lecture, but I was really anxious to talk about the subject, but I had to wait until now. The American Supreme Court ruled that the right to have an abortion is illegal. It's against the Constitution. And they already said that their next goal is to attack the gay marriage. Two things that are a direct war against God. Abortions and marriage that it's illegal in the eyes of the Creator. The liberals in America, as you can see, they go crazy. There's demonstrations all over. In Israel, all the lefties went crazy as well because they know America has an effect in the rest of the world. And the day that it happened, they were so panicking in Israel, quickly the next day they passed a law to give them more rights to make abortion easier. Because until now, if a woman wants to do such things, she has to go to a committee, they ask her questions. Some of the questions are confidential and private. The women don't like to tell anyone their private business. So they, in the old days, they used to care more about people's life. So they didn't just want to, just everyone who wants to do it will do it. They made it a little bit difficult. Not that it's difficult. In, in the end, 99% of them get the approval to do it, or more. Not more than 99%. It's not that a woman wants to do it, she will be forbidden. But they made it not so pleasant, let's say. So the next day, on purpose, oh, Americans want to become conservative. They want to become more religious? Before it happens here, let makes it worse. The next day, they made it a lot easier to abort. The country of the wicked people, Israel, the Holy Land, became one of the most wicked countries in the world. Not the country, not the, the, the land. The land is the Holy Land. You cannot take it away. When God says it's the Holy Land, it's the most important land in the world, nobody can question it. The people, the wicked people, the two, three million liberals, wicked enemies of God that destroyed Israel in the last 70, 80 years are only becoming worse every week. Only becoming worse. You know, sometimes you have a, you have a, a liberal that is really not so evil like most of them. He comes from a different point of view. He's an academic, he, he, he fights for human rights, for minorities. That's technically what's wrong with that. He's trying to defend the weak, trying to defend the minorities. So somebody like that, if he fights to allow women to have an abortion, what's his excuse? That women should have the right on their own body. That's the dumbest excuse. <laughs> what does it mean the woman has the rights on her own body? We are talking about the life of another human being who grows inside a woman. God gave her responsibility to give life to a baby. She's an incubator. So basically what they are saying, that if a baby was born in a six, seven month, and they put him in an incubator in a hospital, 
the doctor have the right on his own incubator. He owns it, I don't know, the owner of the hospital. He might as well go and choke the baby over there and chop him to pieces and vacuum that into a big bag and sell it to China. That's what they do with the pieces. Believe it or not, the Chinese in some places eat it. I never believed such thing can be possible. But I heard it from a very reliable doctor who became very religious. He was very much against religion. He was almost converting to Christianity. And on the way to... to <laughs> actually, it's interesting how Hashem had mercy on that doctor. He doesn't live here. He lives in Mexico. On the way to convert to Christianity, he met a friend on the street, completely secular Jew, not a religious Jew. He told him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to convert to Christianity. And that secular Jew asked him, I am not religious, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I just want to ask you one question. You decided to leave Judaism and transfer yourself into Christianity. The question is, do you know Judaism enough that you decided to leave it? Or you don't know what Judaism is? If you know Judaism and you decided to leave it, fine. But I, something inside me tells me that you have no idea what Judaism is. So how do you decide to leave Judaism for Christianity not knowing what Judaism is? After all, even Christians admit that everything they have, they copy from the Torah. That secular guy told him that on the street. And I started to think on the way, actually I have no idea what Judaism is. How did I decide to leave Judaism when this guy just opened up my eyes? I never even checked enough to know what I'm losing, what I'm leaving. I'm not going to convert to Christianity. Let me give some more time to check what Judaism is. I started to check. And what did he become? Today is a rabbi. He speaks, he makes Bale Tshuva in Spanish for many years, 30 years by now. Perhaps he made uh, thousands of Spanish-speaking people in some Hebrew Bale Tshuva. So the question is, what would have happened if he converted to Christianity never in his life know what he left? He has no idea. Same thing though some of those liberals. They defend abortions, but they don't know what it is. All you have to do is to show them 20 minutes film what happened to the baby in the middle of an abortion. They will kill themselves. Because if you take a baby now and chop him to pieces with a knife in front of their eyes, they will scream, they go crazy, and they will be hospitalized in a mental institution after such a trauma. I, I would faint if I see something like this. I'm sure some of them are not that evil to see such thing and be quiet about it. They probably will fight with a butcher and risk their life to save the baby. So what's this hypocrisy? When the baby is inside covered with skin, you're allowed to put the hand inside and chop him to pieces, according to them. But when you take him out, a second after, if you chop him to pieces, they will call you a murderer and give you the, the electric chair. Does it make any sense? So once I ask one of them, let me ask you a question. You see this, this cute baby? If I take an ox and chop him to a hundred pieces, what do, you, what do you think I deserve to get? He said, life in prison. He said, no, you don't think I deserve to be killed? He said, in some state, I'll give you the death penalty. I'm against death penalty, so I will give you life in prison if I was a judge. So I asked him, what happens if I take the baby before I chop him to pieces and put him in a black garbage bag, cover him very well, nobody can see him, and then I chop him to pieces. I put my hand inside the bag and chop him to pieces. But nobody sees, because it's all in a black bag. Then I seal it and dump it in some dumpster, and they sell it to China, and over there some barbarians, Chinese, they eat it. Then what? He said, what's the difference? Either way, you deserve life in prison. This is a murder, and this is a murder. I say absolutely 100%. That's the argument if abortion is allowed or not. 
when it's outside, all the liberals admit that killing a baby, chopping him to pieces, it's a brutal murder. But when he's covered with the skin, even though he's fully functional, he tastes, he, has, he, he eats, he has brain waves, he understands. I'll give you an example. They did an experiment. They injected sugar to the, to the water inside the wound, you know, the water, and the water became sweeter. They found that the baby drank double. When they did these experiments, he enjoyed the sweet, the sugar. You know, babies enjoy very much sugar. Once he tasted that the water are sweeter, he actually was consuming more of it. So you see that he understands already flavors. He has already desires, like a human being. Okay. Then they made another experiment. They took a little needle, not so sharp. They pinched him on his nose. He moved his head to the side meaning his nerve system is fully functional. This was on the third month of the pregnancy. Third month, 90 days pregnancy, that's it. You can't even see. If you look at the woman, some of them don't even look pregnant after three months. You know, it's hard to tell. So they pinched his nose, he moved his, uh, his, he his head. Then they pinched him again, he moved his head. Four times they repeated it. Every time they pinched him, he moved his head. By the fifth time, before the needle touched his nose, he already moved his head. That means he was anticipating pain on the way. That means his brain is fully functional, working, recognized danger, has a memory, he already experienced that before. And he actually moved his head before the needle touched his nose. And he has a pulse and everything is working. He's just a tiny cre creature yet. He didn't go up to be nine pounds yet. It's less than a pound. Somebody like this you want to chop to pieces? So now the Supreme Court said that I think six weeks or seven weeks, seven weeks. Seven weeks is the period that they were still allowed to do it. After that, according to their opinion, is a murder. According to the Torah, when abortion is officially become a murder, from what day of the, of the pregnancy, everybody admits that in the first week there's still no life. There's no life yet. There's nothing yet. I mean, it's beginning of life, creation, but there's no soul yet. There's no pulse, no brain waves. There's no, no image. You, you, you do a sonogram, you, you don't see a baby yet. So the question is, when does the baby become a baby? When is he a human being? If you kill him before a specific day, he may not be a murder. So the answer is, from the 40th day, Four zero. Once the fourth day arrive, life began. From this moment on, is a human being, one hundred percent, like a regular kid who runs in the neighborhood. Up to forty days, there's still no life. In the fortieth day, he become an official human being. By the way, to abort is a murder for Jews, and also for Gentiles. Gentiles are not allowed to murder. It's against the seven laws of Noah. If a Gentile is making an abortion, it's a death penalty for that doctor. Every abortion he made, he will be executed for when he dies in the court of heaven. Think about it. There's some doctors in America who made 10,000 abortions. Each one of them will be a separate trial for murdering a baby. If it was more than 40 days. Now the problem with these 40 days is that most women, by the time they find out they're pregnant, it's very close to 40. It's very close to 40 days. Usually it's around 30. They realize it's late. They don't run right away after a day or two. Because, you know, so they wait a week or two. By the time two weeks pass and they run and they check until they make an appointment and until it happens, usually it's already past 40 days. But 
some of them did it actually mamash in the 35th day, 37 days, which there was no official life yet. That's still a very big sin because it's preventing future life, but is not as severe like after the 48 days. The Gemara say, when a woman had a miscarriage, Lo aleno, sometimes a woman become pregnant and she lose the baby, naturally. If it was before 40 days, she doesn't become impure. After 40 days, she's already impure. What do you see from here? Because in the 40th day, life began and she just aborted uh, naturally an, a, a living creature that died. That's a special impurity, like the dead body. Because of that, she become impure. So you see the Gemara 2,000 years ago. The Gemara already knew, based on what we received from Hashem in Mount Sinai, that the official life begin in the 40th day. There is a book by a famous doctor in Israel, which we like to show parts of it in a seminar, that based on the experiments and surveys and research that they did in Israel, Every day, every hour they check. They want to see when the pulse begin. And he writes, and he's totally not religious. No connection to religion. Nothing. He writes, in the 40th day, we started to detect life. This, this Israeli secular doctor writes in his book. So that means that exactly like Hashem told us, the 40th days, that's when the Neshama goes in and all of that. So Rabotai, they go crazy in America, but I promise you one thing. All these uh, 100 million liberals who demonstrate and are very upset about the Supreme Court, if they would watch the film I watched about abortion, 90% of them would hide from the embarrassment that they ever supported such a terrible murder of an innocent child. And why is 99% of the abortions are why? Why? Financial reason, which is very stupid, because the Gemara said that the baby comes with his own parnasa, with his own bread. It's the Gemara in Masachet Nida. The Gemara say the baby is coming to the world with his own budget. You know, if a family has one child and they poor, so they're nervous. Should we have another child? We are barely pay the bills right now. Well, they say one child is not enough. So they have another child. They're still poor. Then they have a third child. They're still poor. Then they have a fourth child. Once the fourth child comes to the world, this family becomes very wealthy. All of a sudden, the father made the deal of his life got into some real estate deals, made up money, bought Bitcoin for $900, and it went up to 60000 He made his money, I don't know, he had uh, barely $10,000, it became three, four million dollars. From now, he became very wealthy. They don't see the connection that the only reason they got wealthy is because they had the four child. All the wealth belonged to him. He came to the world in a fortune that Hashem wanted that baby to live a wealthy lifestyle, to grow up wealthy. So he brought his family the wealth. Not the other way around, like parents think they are taking care of their children, they are feeding them, they are buying them, they are doing for them, they had to, to work so hard to supply for them. It's the exact opposite. It's the other way around. He come to the world with his budget, and his budget goes into your bank account until he will get married. Once he will get married, the money will come from you and go to him. Whether you give it to him and help him and make him a marriage, I mean a wedding, and buy him a house, so that's from his parnasa that you got in the last 18 years, and you put it on the side and did business, it all belongs to him. You don't know yet. After he get married, you have to put hundreds of thousands into that child. And you're thinking, I did such a favor to this kid. 
And one day when you pass, Hashem said to you, you didn't do anything. That was his money. Without him, if you would not give birth to him, Hashem, you make an abortion, and he wouldn't come to the world, you would never get that money to begin with. And we know it because it's written in our holy Gemara. <laughs> We're not making up stuff. Remember, when you teach Torah, when you teach Judaism, you teach the divine truth. You don't teach what you think is right. Or based on your own common sense, on your logic. No. You teach only what has a source. I made a rule many, many years ago. Many years ago. Some of my teachers, I saw how careful they are not to say something that may be questionable. I ask, why don't you use this proof? Why do we need it for? We have thousands of solid proofs that nobody argue with. Why should we bring something that will start in our argument? For what? We know we're right, but that person may get confused. Let's use only things that have sources without any question. That when someone argue, immediately you show him the source, Rambam, Rashi, Zohar, Gemara, Chumash, that's Shulchan Aruch, finished. Don't argue. Once it's read, somebody actually on the way here from Italy, she sent a message. She came to the verse in Tehillim that speaks about when the wicked people die, you have to make a party. So today she admitted that basically, not, not clearly, but that's what comes out of her words, that until now she didn't believe it. She heard me saying it many times over the years, but she never saw the source. And I, should be, I actually gave the source a few times for sure. But she, I, I don't know, she didn't know maybe the source. Today when she came to that verse with the translation, she saw, she said, wow, you actually were right all along. So what do you think, I make up stuff? I come one day with, based on my mood and I make up a new idea and I come and teach it like God say it? No, if somebody does such thing, there's no more, more wicked than him. That's what we call reform. They make up their own stuff. Everything they like to do, they make it kosher. Whatever the Torah say you're not allowed to do, they like to do, they make it kosher. You want to do something wrong, at least you should be brave enough and strong enough to admit that it's wrong. Not to start modifying the truth of God, to, uh, to adjust it to what you want to do. You want to steal, now you make stealing kosher. You want to kill, now you make killing kosher, like the Muslims do. They Jews, they want to kill the Jews. So they make it kosher. Oh, that's what God wants. But the Torah say, which you all believe in, the Muslims, you should not kill. Ah, they never heard about that verse. Why? Because they have an agenda. And they want to match their religion to their agenda. Which obviously is a terrible thing. Now, that leads me to the, to the topic tonight. It's a perfect example in the Torah of two giants who argue... One is for the sake of heaven, and one is for the sake of his honor. Now remember, I told you that many times in the past. When you read the stories of the Torah, God forbid to think that the stories came to entertain us, like some kind of a movie. Every story that you read in the Torah, believe me, there were hundreds of other stories that are not in the Torah. In order for you to know, but then you have to go to a Midrash or to a Zohar. If it's already written in the Torah, it means that God's intention was to teach us a very important fundamental principle in life. Otherwise, it would not appear in the Torah. The Torah doesn't just bring stories for the sake of gossip or because they are interesting. No. If they are there, then means there's so much to learn, and we're going to learn. Parashat Korach. You know, Korach comes, and he doesn't like that Moshe is the king. His brother is the high priest, the Kohen, Aaron. And uh, 
Now, you know, he sees that he's, he's supposed to be next on the list, and they skip him, and they go to the younger cousin, which is the son of the fourth brother. He said, I don't understand. Amram is your father. He, he, Moshe and Aaron came from Amram. Okay, so you got the first positions. The third position should come from the second brother, the brother of Amram, the next one, not the fourth one. Why you are nominating the son of the fourth one when I'm actually the son of the second one? Something here smells of politics. Moshe, you're probably doing things on your own. It cannot be that that's what God told you. Now let's go a little bit, you know, deeper and find out who was Korach. First of all, Korach, he was held the ark. The ark had a, a miracle attached to it. If you know, if we want to lift now a heavy table, we need four people to lift it. Let's say the table is 200 pounds. So if everybody holds it in one corner, everybody will hold about approximately 50 pounds, right? Four, four people, 200 pounds, about 50 pounds. How long you can walk with 50 pounds on your shoulder? Some would walk five minutes, some 10 minutes, some an hour, and that's it. You have to put it down. It's very heavy. I need to rest. The ark had a, a magic, a magic attached to it. When you hold it, not only you don't feel any weight, the ark carries you against gravity. So it's like, it's like, a, like a spaceship that flies and you hold it and you actually walk with it and you don't have to even walk hard. Not only you don't feel any weight, the ark carries you like a balloon. If you hold a big, huge balloon, you're going to start flying up. Why? Because it carries it carry you up. You know, when a person dies, he weighs a little bit more than when he's alive. If you're 200 pounds when you're alive, if you die, you're going to be 202, 203. Why? You gain weight after you died? <laughs> From what? The answer is the soul came out. The soul is a divine energy. It always push up towards the sky. So when the soul inside you, it pushes you up. Similar to if you stand on a scale and press a table next to it. What happened to the, to the weight? It goes down like a few pounds, right? Because you're leaning on something. So it brings the body higher. That's one reason why the monkeys that have the same DNA like people, at least by 99%, one major difference between us and them besides the hair is that they are, they are bending down. They're not, they are not able to stand straight like a human being. A person can stand straight. Completely straight. A monkey can never stand straight. He will always be bending down. Why? Because he doesn't have a soul. The soul is the one who makes you always, and all other animals, their face is always facing the ground. Why? They came from the ground, and there's nothing by ground by them. And blood, nefesh. They don't have a soul. They don't have a divine soul. But people that have a soul, they are different than the animals. So Korach is carrying the Aaron, which is a very important job. Plus, Korach is the richest guy in the nation of Israel. Until today, when someone in Israel wants to describe a wealthy person, they say in Hebrew an expression, Ashirka Korach. Most Israelis have no idea what they are saying. I ask him exactly, what does it mean, Ashirka Korach? Who was Korach? They have no idea. But they know that that's an expression that's been going on for thousands of years. Ashir Korach, wealthy like Korach. Why? Korach was very rich. He had 300 white mules. What mule? Mule, it's a baby of a horse and a donkey. A mule. What's the difference between a donkey, a horse, and a mule? The mule looks like half donkey, half horse. But the donkey can give birth, and the horses can give birth, but the mule cannot give birth, cannot multiply. 
Why? Because it's a combination of two different species. Horse and a donkey, they can mix together, create life, but that life cannot have continuation. It's very interesting. So, what happened with the mule? There's few kinds of mule. The white one, the Maharsha said, the white one are very cruel. If you come and near them and they feel threatened by you, they will give you such a kick with the back, with the rear uh, legs, they stand on the front legs and they give you such a kick with the, with the, with the rear uh, legs and you die on a the spot. There's no way to get safe. If they kick you, you're dead. Korach on purpose chose this kind of pradot levanot, the Midrash say. Why? Now nobody comes near his wealth. Remember, there was no banks and safes. So people had to carry their wealth with them. Like Avram, everywhere he goes, he carries his, his, his camels, his, his sheep, his, his cattle. If you have gold, jewelry, you have to carry it with you. There's nowhere to put them because people are moving from one place to another. It's not safe. You have to materialize your wealth into merchandise. Gold, animals. Why? Because today people can keep it in the bank. CDs, all kinds of things like this, in safes. Back then it was not like that. How people know if you're wealthy? When you walk, they see how many sheep walking with you. 500, 1,000, 10,000. How many shepherds are working for you? The more sheep you have, the more wealthy you are. The more horses you have, the more wealthy you are. And one horse can be equal to a thousand horses. When you go to upstate New York, you see a lot of tired horses there in a, in a field. How much they worth? Not even a thousand dollars each. You can see, for little kids, they come horse riding. But if you have a... Arabic horse from the OTB, you know the race? The race is what could be $40 million. One horse, $25 million. Do you know how much money they pay them just to get the seed from that horse to create another baby like him? Do you know how much insurance they pay on those horses if he gets hurt? They can lose $30, $40 million if, if his leg gets hurt. It's a whole industry. One horse can be equal like a thousand. Just like people. Not all people have the same value. One righteous man, real righteous, serious, that has a lot of merit, can be equal to 10,000 other men that are, that are also religious. One righteous, very big chacham that has schuyot, can be on a scale equal like 10,000 others. Like Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Rav Ovadia, Rav Ben Sion Abba Shaul, Stipler, Chazonish. Each one of them you put on a scale, and you put, you put 10,000 ordinary religious people from Brooklyn and Queens, or anywhere else, put them on a scale, even though they go to shul, they put filin, they come to lecture sometimes, put 10,000 of them on one side, put the Chazonish on the other side, is equal like 10,000. How do you know the value of a person? In Shamayim, they don't evaluate you by how much money you have. That's a joke. <laughs> the money you have, I gave you. Uh, that makes you value? No. The value is determined based on achievement and efforts. Efforts even more than achievements. A person put a lot of efforts to be righteous, to learn a lot of Torah. He puts time. He puts you know, a lot of sweat into it. Even if he did not become a giant chacham, he's an ordinary one. He's already getting a huge reward and a, and a huge value. Why? Because of the efforts. Which is very interesting because in this world, if you want to be a guitar player, you practice 10,000 hours. You did not become Santana or Clapton or all these great guitar players. You didn't become... So, anybody care about you? Ah, but I played 10,000 hours. You know, you know how much I practice? More than him. I practice more than him. But you don't play as half as good as him. 
When we want to do a show, we want to get a real good guitar player. What do we care how many hours you practice? You good or you not? You know how to sing or you don't know how to sing? Some people don't even need to practice. They come to all these shows. Uh, what the, the name of it? Kochav Nolad. A star is born. First time on a, on a stage. Ta, 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 ta. Wow, everybody clap, this, that. Wonderful, little kid. Next day is a star everywhere. Why? He was born with a talent. Did he achieve anything? Nothing. Hashem gave him a voice. <laughs> he heard a few people sing. He tried it at home. And surprisingly, it's very good. How much effort he put into it? None. Or very little. So for that, you don't get evaluated for something you're born with or something that you naturally have or a look or something like that. That doesn't give you credit. The only thing that gives you credit is what you achieve with effort. Praying, working hard, learning the language, learning how to read, learning Torah. All these things require a lot of efforts. So the more efforts you put, the higher your value is. God forbid if Hashem needs to bring us a punishment, to give us a serious punishment, the Satan is uh, attacking, and 10,000 Jews have to die, many times Hashem will replace them with one righteous one. Instead of 10,000, he will take one big chacham, big tzaddik. Why? Because he's equal on a scan like 10,000. And he anyway is old. So you know what? Let's take you. And like this... Instead of taking 10,000 people, we give them extension that they can do tshuva. So Korach is coming and say to Moshe, I want to ask you a question. First of all, he wants to make himself a coalition. He knows if he comes alone against Moshe, he doesn't have that much of a chance. But if he will bring 250 important people, leaders, 250 against two, that's a whole different story. So first, you know, it's mamash very similar to the way they formed the rotten, wicked coalition of the government in Israel a year ago, who just collapsed a week ago. How did they form such a rotten, wicked, anti-God coalition? One clown, a traitor, a liar, a deceiver, who told all the people that he's a righty that is anti-Hamas and anti-murderers and anti-things like this, and even have a little tiny yamaka size of a quarter, he decided that he wants to be a prime minister, even though he only had four mandates. It's nothing. Nobody becomes prime minister in less than 30. But since nobody could become a prime minister, they say, you know what? I won't be, you won't be, let him be. You okay? Not me and not you. Let him be. But he's nothing. Nobody voted for him. Once they put him in, he changed completely everything he'd been saying all along. Complete opposite. And he took the Muslim brothers and the gays and the anti-Torah and the liberals and the lefties, all the enemies of God, and formed a wicked coalition. What unite all these wicked people? They all have different ideology. The Muslim brothers wants to kill all Jews and steal Israel. They are anti-gays. They don't want gays. The gays are, their biggest enemies are those Muslims because as soon as they get into power, they'll hang all of them. How they became brothers? The gays and the Muslim brothers. They have one thing in common. All of them hate Bibi. Just not Bibi. Bibi Netanyahu. Every one of them is hurt by Netanyahu. He put them down. He didn't respect them. He didn't count them. So they all hate him. So when everybody hates one person, all of them for the time being became friends. Once we get rid of him, then every one of us will go back to his direction. That's exactly what happened. That's 100% what happened with Korach. I know you're not still understanding what I am about to explain, but in a few minutes it will be very clear to you. Let's see what really happened here. 
The Ramban, 750 years ago, he said, Korach was bitter. He's very jealous with Moshe's success, with Aaron. He didn't get the job he expected to get. So what does he do? He get Datan and Aviram. Datan and Aviram. Who are the two, the two most wicked people from the time the Jews were in Egypt? All the problems that were made for Moshe Rabbeinu is Datan and Aviram. The two wicked people already in Egypt, they made problems. Datan and Aviram. One of them, his wife, the husband, the, the Egyptian soldier liked his wife, Shlomit Badivri. She was talking too much on the streets. The Egyptian guy, the soldier, liked her. So he sent him to work, extra difficult, that he can be with his wife. So when, this is the Egyptian that Moshe killed. This Egyptian. Later, instead of thanking him, he said, oh, you want, when they beat up each other, you want to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? You fool, I helped you. He was kidnapping your wife from you. I helped you, I saved you from the situation. Instead of kissing my feet, you want to tell the power that I killed the soldier? Moshe had to run out of Egypt. And remember, he was a prince in a palace. So now he had to run to Midian. He ran to Midian. That's where he met his wife, Tzipora. Even when you think your life is over, you lose the palace, you lose your position, you are the king, you're walking around, live the life of a king. Now you lose everything in a minute, you have to run to exile. What happened? He meets Zipporah. He meets Zipporah, he gets married. So what happened next? Her father is the Pope, master of idol worshipping of the whole world. He brings him close to Judaism, to the truth. He converts, he leaves the Avodah Zara. Thousands of other goyim see that the rabbi, the master of Avodah Zara, changed side. What do you think it did to them? A lot of them left the garbage that he was teaching them. Why, if the teacher left it, what do I have to do here? Okay, so a lot of good things happen. So now, Korach right away make a coalition with Datan and Aviram. Why he went to them before he even get the 250 others? Datan and Aviram, as bad as they were, there was one good thing about them. Why? They were very popular among the Jewish nation. Why? Because the Egyptians, they nominated kapos, you know, like the Nazis. The Nazis didn't do most of the job. They took Jewish people and they made them kapos. Kapo means uh, police. They told the Jews, you make sure that the Jews do what they have to do. As long as they do what we ask, we will not get involved. You get the job done. If they don't get the job done, you pay the price. Make sure they do what's, what we ask for. The couples were more cruel than the Nazis. Some Jews, they had nightmares, not from the Nazis, from the couples. The couple, in order for him to save his skin, became more monster than the actual Nazi to his own brothers, just to save his own skin. The Egyptians already made that idea of kapos way before the Nazis. So who were the kapos? Datan and Aviram, among others. While others made a lot of hard time for the Jewish people to save their skin, Datan and Aviram every night would get beat up by the whip for not pressuring them too much and taking the beating for their brothers. As wicked as they are, as jealous as they are with Moshe, they question everything he does, but one thing they do, they get beaten up every night because they don't put too much pressure on the miserable slaves. That's why the, the nation liked them. That's why they came out of Egypt, because wicked people did not come out of Egypt. But they came out of Egypt. Why? Because they were getting a much brutal beating every night for their own brothers. And Hashem liked it very much. So as much as I hate what they do to Moshe, 
But look how much they're willing to suffer to protect the other servants, the slaves. So what happened, Rabotai? First thing, he gets Datan and Aviram, who anyway hates Moshe. They already have a history of making him problems. Once he got Datan and Aviram and he gets popularity, who's next? 250 leaders. Now I want to tell you, these 250 leaders, they are all Bechorim. They are firstborn and they are very upset that they lost the merit to serve in the Mishkan, in the temple. After the sin of the golden calf, up to the sin of the golden calf, they were the servant in the temple, in the house of God. Once they already the sin of the golden calf took place, Hashem canceled their nomination and gave it to the Levim. The Levim took over, the family of Moshe. So they are very angry, very jealous, but for good reason. They want to be holy. I was serving inside the temple, and now I'm not. I want to go back to the holy job ahead. So they are actually joining the fight for the sake of heaven. They're not jealous with Moshe, or they're not questioning his kingdom. They just want to get back their job. Soon we're going to see how it's connected. Korah has a different agenda. Datan and Aviram, different agenda. Everybody has a different agenda over here. Let's see what the Ramban say. The Ramban say, Datan and Aviram has a long history that they hate Moshe. On Ben Pelet, who is On Ben Pelet? Another famous person. On Ben Pelet, his, his real name was Nemuel Ben Eliav. Nemuel Ben Eliav. Who is Nemuel Ben Eliav? Guess who? The brother of Datan and Aviram. So Eliav is the father of Datan and Aviram. And they now have a new star, a new brother. Who is he? On Ben Pellet. On Ben Pellet has, has a smart wife. Korach has an evil wife, like the wife of Haman. She instigates. Some women build a house. Some women destroy the house. Some women build a husband. Some women destroy the husband. How they build them and destroy them? By the advice they give them. A good woman, she tells her husband, go learn Torah, stay away from politics. What is it going to help you to be jealous, to fight? What are you going to go? Trust Hashem, leave it alone. Don't make fights, don't make machloket. Hashem is going to provide. That's a kosher wife. Some wife are a witch. That's a, you know, she, she has a broom. She flies from place to place. She has long nails. <laughs> and she likes to give terrible advice. What's the advice? Moshe, how come your brother is buying house in Jamaica mistake and you are still here in Fresh Meadow? I don't like it. You have more money than him. You help him to get into the business. He's going to buy a better house than us. I don't like it. I'm going to make a big problem. I'm going to talk to your parents. They're probably helping him out. I don't, I'm going to make a big fight. You better do something. The poor husband, he didn't even care about these things. She sent him into the war, and then the whole family goes on fire. Everybody hates everybody, cursing, Lashon Nara. Sometimes it gets to, into bloodshed. That's a terrible wife. So the wife of Korach is like this. Maze, you are the richest guy in the in, in land of Israel. You also from the family of Levi. You come, your father come next after Amram, and you didn't get the job? On my dead body. Korach, you better wake up. Don't let them do this to you. The wife of On Ben Pellet, the exact opposite. She said to him, I don't understand. Why would you join Korach? If Moshe will win, you will stay in your situation. If Korach will win, you will stay in your situation. What will you gain? Either way, you're going to stay in the same place. Why would you start a war against the messenger of God? I'm not letting you go. He said, but I already gave them my word. 
that I will join them. Leave it to me. Leave it to me. When they came to call him, remember, they built a coalition. On, on Shabbat in the yeshiva, I gave a speech. And I asked the guys, I have one question to ask. What's the question? We have the same situation today in Israel. We have three wicked people. Like Korach, Datan, and Aviram. Who, who do we have? We have Bennett. We have Lapid and we have Lieberman. Three Reshaim Arurim, Shem Reshaim Irkav. I just do not know. Bennett is Korach, but who is Datan and Aviram? <laughs> Lieberman is Datan. <laughs> That's already a question. Mamash, the same idea. Bennett sold his agenda in a minute just to be a prime minister. Now he gave his partner, Lapid, another Rasha Merusha. There is three months until the election. You help me to become a prime minister, you can be a prime minister for three months. He will be memorizing the history of Israel that me and you were prime ministers. Thank you very much, Bennett. I appreciate it. Lapid now is the prime minister. He doesn't have education. He's the biggest, dumbest idiot in the history of Israel. If you see his interviews, it's, not, it's Mamash hard to believe. So Bennett say, since I help you to become a prime minister and I, I, I moved from my seat to allow you to be, I would like you to approve to me special benefits like other prime minister has. So Lapid said to him, but you were only prime minister for a few months. What benefits you want? Other prime minister, there were for years. You, your government collapsed. Why? He said, Ma, you're not going to give me special benefits for life? He said, no, I will oppose that. <laughs> a minute after he put him on the seat. That reminds me about a joke. About a joke, you know, two ugly guys, two ugly guys saw a machine, like a car wash on the street. The machine say, if you pay a hundred dollars, you become handsome in any image you choose. Press a button, you're gonna be blonde, you're gonna be this, you're gonna be curly hair, white hair, whatever you like. So they said, wow, finally we're gonna get out of our misery. So they checked the pocket. One guy had a hundred dollar bill, the other one counted everything, he had $98, $98. He said to him, wow, together we have exactly what we need. So, uh, so you go first, they'll give you a dollar change, and when you come out, you give me the dollar, and I also become nice looking. So yeah, great idea. The first guy went in, he comes out, blonde, blue eyes. <laughs> he looked like a monkey before. <laughs> yeah, hey! That's you? I can't believe it. Give me the dollar. I say, go to work, you ugly monkey. <laughs> A minute after, he forgot him already. This is the kind of clowns that run Israel right now. I know you think I'm ex exaggerating. Believe me, I'm not. I actually go easy on them. They are a lot dumber than what I say. A lot dumber than what I say. If you think Sleepy Joy is dumb, you don't know what we're talking here about. Mamash, three fools, took over Israel just to get rid of Bibi. Bibi is not righteous. It's not Shomer Mitzvot. It's not Shomer Shabbat. It's not a holy man, let's put it that way. But at least he's not an idiot. He has a brain in his head. He knows how to think. He understands what, you know, what's good for the country, what's not. These three clowns, Hashem Yerachem. And Israel is in their hands, believe it or not. So, it's very similar over here. So, uh, on Ben Pellet, his wife told him, when they come to call you, I'm going to take care of them real good. When they came, he was laying in bed on Ben Pellet. And what happened? She was sitting by the door. 
as soon as they came to call him, she took out her cover and her hair came out. Do you know what it means in those days to see a hair of a woman? Not like this. Like the devil. No! If you're not going to run away from here, I don't know what I'm going to do. And they ran. And that's how he got saved. Otherwise, he would be swallowed in the ground with them. I don't understand. What's going on over here? People declare a war against the messenger of God who performed the biggest miracles in the history that any human being ever performed. The ten plagues of Egypt, the opening of the Red Sea, man is falling from heaven, manna every day, a whale is going with them, supplying them with water. There's no question, everybody heard Hashem speaking to him in Mount Sinai and not to anyone else. They declare a war against the messenger of Hashem. And now they worry about looking at the woman's hair. By the way, a, a side comment. From here you see that a woman should have hair. For those who shave their head, a woman needs to have hair. Like the Zohar said. That's her beauty and she needs to be pretty. The question is who she should be pretty to. She should be pretty for her men. Not for every, you know, everyone on the street. Keep the law of modesty in public when she's alone, when the house, that's it. She has her privacy. Anyway, Rabotai, it gets interesting. We're going to learn a lot of the human psychology and jealousy and all other bad traits here. They all, why they waited until now, until Korach gathered them together? Everyone had an agenda, right? So let's see. On Ben Pelet, as I said, the brother of Datan and Aviram, and the 250 people, the leaders, they were all firstborn. And they, they were very upset that they lost their position. They want to be Kohanim, they want to be prophets, they want to see the holiness of the temple. After the golden calf, they, they, they lost their position. The question is, why didn't they do anything about it until now? They were quiet. All these times, they were not attacking. The Ramban say, as long as Moshe Rabbeinu performed miracles, nobody had the power to start an opposition to Moshe. Because the nations are admiring him, because people are not so smart. They are impressed. People are impressed by someone who performs magics and miracles. I want to remind you that when Moshe came to Pharaoh to take the Jewish nation out of Egypt, he threw the cane on the floor and he became a snake. What did the Khartoumim do? The little kids that were by Paro, they threw their canes and they all became snake. The filthiest people in the world, they throw a cane to the floor and they become a snake. Nobody ever doubted that they are the filthiest and the most impure people, wicked, idol worshippers, and all kinds of other crimes they perform daily. How all of a sudden, how all of a sudden they are able to perform miracles, just like Bilam, another filthy, wicked person. Why? Because miracles can be performed from holiness, and from the exact opposite, it's called kuchot atumah, sitra achra. Remember this expression, sitra achra. Sitra achra in Aramic means the other side. The opposite side of holiness. Ele keneged ele barashem. So as long as Moshe performing miracles, nobody dared to make a beep. So how can I open my mouth? Look what he's doing. Everyone admires him. Once the miracle finished, all but the courage to stop. When the sin of the spies came, remember a week before the spies came and spoke Lashon Arab at Israel. Moshe said to Hashem, Moshe, before Moshe was fighting to defend the Jewish nation. Like he said, if you want to kill them, delete me from your book. Erase me from your book. 
But after the sin of the spies, Moshe was so upset, so he said, all of you are going to die in a desert. None of you will make it up to the land of Israel. You will all die here because of that sin. Meaning Moshe that was always protecting them, now all of a sudden is cursing them. All of you will die. So they get angry now. Oh, now you're not with us anymore. You, until now you will fight for us. What happened all of a sudden? And Moshe say, in 40 years from now, all of you will die. One day a year, 15,000 will die. 15,000 men between age 20 and 60. Why 15,000? 600,000 divided by 40 years. 15,000 died a day. When? What day? What day? It's coming soon, in 40 days. Tisha B'Av. One of the worst day of the year. Not one of the worst. The worst day of the year. Yom Kippur, it's not a bad day. It's a good day. Day of atonement, day of repentance. Very good. Holy. Tisha B'Av, a day of mourning. Two temples were broken. I mean, destroyed. And the people of the Jewish nation that came out of Egypt, every Tisha B'Av, they made a grave, and they all lay down in a grave, hoping that they'll be able to come out of there. Hoping that they're going to come out of there. 15,000 every year did not come out. I want to ask you a question. You know, imagine this. You went into the grave. You waited the entire 24 hours. It got dark. It got dark. Tisha B'Av finished. You look next to you, some of your friends died. Relatives, friends. You came out, you're okay. I have another year of life. You calm down. I want to ask you, the people that saw 39 years, almost everyone died. They are the last 15,000 that remained. That's it. It's the 40 and then. Now they know for sure they're going to die this year. 39 years, there was a chance to come out. Who's to say that I'll die? But the last year, you already know you die. You're going to die. It's different. Because now you know for sure you're going to die. Because you're not going to see Israel. And that was the situation. So now they're very upset. Okay, so then what? Datan and Aviram used to be wealthy. And then they became poor. How do we know? The Midrash says, Hashem said to Moshe when he was in Midian, now it's time for you to go to Egypt to take my nation out. Moshe said, but people are looking to kill me over there. Hashem said to Moshe, the people that are looking to kill you, they all died. Who was Hashem talking about? Datan and Aviram. They are the ones who told Paro that he killed the Egyptian. But they are alive. What does it mean they died? The Gemara brings a list of people that once something happened to them, that from this moment on they consider death. Among the list, you have people that become blind. A person that becomes blind, cannot see anymore, is considered like dead. Even though he's still eating, walking, you know, people help him. But, Suma, Iver Hashuf Kemet. And also poor people, people that lost everything they had. But not someone with 100 million, now we have 5 million. But Bachelot became very miserable. Why? This is not good. What happened? Still 5 million. Ah, come on, 5 million. I can't even buy a house in Jamaica, mistake. So, what happened? We're not talking this kind of poor. Yeah, this kind of poor, they either are, they used to have a lot of money. Bitcoin went down to 19,000. <laughs> they lost a lot. We are not talking about this kind of poor. We're talking about poor that cannot buy feeling for the bar mitzvah of their kid. And I know hundreds like this. They cannot put gas in a car. Most of them don't have a car. They cannot pay the $40 a month for their cell phone. This kind of poor people. They can't pay anything. What, even food they need, they need this, they need the uh, Hasdain Omi, all these organizations. The last time they ate a chicken, they don't remember. There, there are half a million kids in Israel who goes to bed hungry every night. 
that's the statistic that they gave a few years ago. I believe now it's much worse. Meaning going to bed with the stomach is grinding. But you couldn't eat a piece of rye bread with some cheese. How much it costs? 10 cents, 15 cents, 20 cents. How much a slice cost? The answer is, yes, it adds up. They have to pay rent. They have to pay this. They have to pay electric. After paying all the bills, they have no money left for food. It reminds me that uh, there's one Moroccan guy. He's a grandpa already. He has many grandchildren. He has a beautiful, uh, he has a beautiful uh, minhag. Every Thursday night at 8, between 8 and 10, he gets all his grandchildren. And all his grandchildren are coming to him to learn the parashat Shavua with Rashi. One time his wife told him, I don't have any food. I have to cook for Shabbos. And uh, I need to go to Machne Yehuda, to the market in Yerushalayim, to buy some vegetables, fruits, nothing. We don't have anything. He said to her, but the kids will come in an hour. She said, tell the kids to come tomorrow. If you, bu you buy food, I'll be able to cook. I don't want to cook tomorrow. It's a short day. It's not going to be enough time. All the guests coming for Shabbat. He said, hey, listen, I have a rule. I do not cancel Shur Torah no matter what. Not Fort and July, not fireworks, not Super Bowl, none of this nonsense. I cannot tell the grandchildren not to show up. Bezrat Hashem, I'll wake up very early tomorrow, I'll go to the market. Ten o'clock, the shiur finished, all the grandchildren left. Ten minutes after ten, somebody knocked on the door. He was sure one of the grandkids forgot something. He opened the door, a robber with a gun and a mask. He came in with a gun. Two old people, a man and a woman. Move to the side, give us all the jewelry, give us all the money you have, give us everything. The guy was a smart man. He started, ah, you coming to rob us? We don't even have what to eat tomorrow for Shabbat. Open the fridge, see? We don't even have a carrot. Open the fridge, no eggs, no meat, no nothing. Tomorrow is Shabbat, we don't know what we're going to eat. Open the cabinets. <laughs> the robber came to rob them. And the guy said to him, Tomorrow, Shabbat, it's Thursday, 10 after 10 at night. Shabbat is at 4 o'clock tomorrow. Look, we don't have nothing. Nothing. We couldn't cook anything for Shabbat. We are too old and poor people. You want to rob us? The guy said, oh, Labachti, where I came. He took out 300 shekels from his pocket. <laughs> And then Shabbat is on me. <laughs> a true story. <laughs> Mr. Vaklin ate on Shabbat <laughs> with the money of the, of the, of the robber. <laughs> Something like this can happen only in Israel. Even a Jewish thief, but has the heart of a Jew. <laughs> he, saw, he came to steal from them. He saw their situation. Forget it. Here, take money for Shabbat. Unbelievable. Anyway, Rabotai... So the Tan and Aviram lost all their money. Kimetu kol ha'anashim mevakshim et nafshecha. They didn't really die. Rashi writes, they became poor. And they don't have an ability to do anything. They cannot do any harm anymore. Moshe, on the other hand, became a billionaire. How? Who knows how Moshe became so rich? From the commandments he broke. The commandments that he broke was very big, very thick, very heavy. And it was made from pure sapphire. You know how expensive it is? Go, take, go to 47th Street, ask for a nice sapphire stone, see how, how much it's going to be. Millions. Big, nice one. This was huge pieces that he broke. Each piece worth, according to today, tens of millions of dollars. It's so precious. But forget about the value of the precious stone. The tablets are made in heaven. The first and last time in history that Hashem designed 
something and gave it to people. Because remember, everything Hashem made in the world is raw material. And we have to process it. You want to build a house, you have to cut trees, you have to bring rocks, you have to do things, you have to, you have to use sand, but you have to create. You want to make a diamond, you find the diamonds in a mine, and it takes time to prepare it. You want to make a jewelry out of gold, you have to find the gold, it takes a long time. Over here, I actually prepared the first commandment, the tablets, with his writing. After Moshe broke it, it has a sentimental value. Forget about the precious stone. Even the precious stone would be today like $500 million. But that's not the real value. The real value, if we had those tablets today, it would be more than $100 trillion. That would be the value of it. More than the value of the whole state of Israel. Because any amount of money would be able to ask for it. Do you know how many Christians and how many Muslims and how many fanatic other religious people would give everything just to own a piece? This was made by God. Not just the material in nature made by God. The actual tablet made by God. And that's the, the first commandment. We don't know where it is. It's somewhere, buried somewhere. Moshe had it. And he was very wealthy. And they lost everything they had, these two Reshaim. Lieberman and uh, Lapid, Hashem cleaned them out. Now they don't have money. The only one is a billionaire is this Bennett. By the way, he's a really rich guy, Bennett. He owns the high tech business. Accidentally, it worked out for him. I heard an interview that he said how he made, how Americans decided to invest tens of millions of dollars in his company. Out of nowhere. He didn't know what to do. They didn't have a product. He admit that when they came to the American, they did not have any product ready to show them. They just had an idea. They found some fool who agreed to give the millions of dollars to sit together and bring it into action. And he said the first one failed. We lost all their money. And then we asked, we came again and asked for 10 times more money and changed completely the first idea, like a whole different business. And somehow they gave the money. Why? Because Hashem wanted this fool to be rich. Why? Because he wanted him to go into politics. And when you're very rich, you go into politics, even if you're the dumbest person in the land. You have money, you can do things. And that was our punishment. For one year, it destroyed Israel. We gave 54 billion to the Muslim brothers. <laughs> Passed terrible laws against the Torah and against the Yeshivot. Made such a damage, will take 100 years to fix. Why? Hashem punished us with this clown. And then when I say it, he gets offended. Why I attack him? And the other fool, Lieberman, he called me a a speaker of hate. I asked him, what do you think about what Rabbi Mizrahi is attacking you on the news and all that? So he said, I don't, that's not the kind of Rabbi I like. <laughs> Why? Yeah, because I told the world how wicked they are and how they destroy the Torah and Yeshiva, they don't like it. So, anyway, Rabotai, now we're going to learn The Tan and Aviram are very jealous. They used to be rich, now they're poor. Moshe used to be poor, now he's rich. Now, imagine if you want to go to politics and you come to all the poor people in America and you tell them, I will represent your case. I know all of you are suffering, suffering from poverty. I, the richest guy in the world, will fight for your rights. Yeah, right. He lives in a $200 million home and he came to preach to the poor people. I really understand your pain. Anyone will take him serious? Who can represent the poor? Someone that came from the garbage. Now he has a lot of money. He went to politics. He comes to the poor. I remember where I came from. And they show a video where he grew up. And the poor people identified with him. Oh! At least somebody understand our pain. Someone who grew up in a, the son of Bill Gates, grew up in a $100 million mansion, 
and live like a king. Now imagine he runs to politics, he say, I decided to help the poor people in America. Oh, it's going to take him serious. You understand what it means to be poor? No. So, Korach, he brings 250 people, and they know they're upset. They gave their job to Shevet Levi. Datan and Aviram cannot stand the rich because they are poor. He takes them also. And 250 people, let's say they will, be, they will win the argument and they get the kingdom out of the hands of Moshe. Moshe will resign, Aaron will resign, now they have the kingdom and they have the keuna. Who's gonna be, what's gonna be after that? Let's say they won the argument. Moshe say, okay, I don't wanna cause a fight, I don't wanna cause a, a fight between the brothers, you do not want me to be the king? Fine. You don't want uh, Aaron to be the king? Fine. We both resign. We retired. Retired. <laughs> so, then what would be? Okay, so now they won. Who's going to be the coin? Korach, Datan, Aviram. Everybody will start killing each other. The Gemara say... Every machloket that is for the sake of heaven, sofa lit kayem. And every sofa lit kayem means in the end we'll have an existence. And every machloket, every disagreement that is not for the sake of heaven, and sofa lit kayem. It will not remain. Meaning it doesn't have an existence for long term. The Gemara say, what's a disagreement for the sake of heaven? And what's a disagreement not for the sake of heaven? The Gemara answer, the machloket for the sake of heaven is machloket Shammai and Hillel. Shammai and Hillel were two great big rabbis. Each one of them has his own yeshiva and his own student. And they had arguments about the truth of the Torah. How you should do it, this way, that way. What's the punishment for that? What's the punishment for that? And some of the subjects, there are many big arguments. At the same time, when they disagree with other hundreds of topics, they still marry their children together. One rabbi say, it's allowed to do this on Shabbat. The other one say, absolutely not. It's death penalty. What is he talking about? Today, immediately they become enemies. Why? Because the argument is to win, not, for the, not to fight the truth. If you fight for the truth, your friend thinks that that's the truth of the Torah. The other rabbi think the opposite. But it doesn't mean that it's both of them right to find the truth of God. They, they will still respect each other because he's Gadol Torah and he's Gadol Torah. So Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel disagreed but stayed friends and their students married their kids together. This rabbi and that rabbi, the opposite in many and they can wait for their kids, his son with his daughter. Mazadov, how do you marry to your enemy, to your opponent? So what? He's my opponent in Anachah. But we are like brothers. What are we looking for? We are only fighting for the truth of the Torah. Nothing personal. There's no politics here. The Gemara asks, and what disagreement is not for the sake of heaven? Machloket Korach ve'adato. The question that I ask is, Korach and Adato, meaning Korach is group. Why they don't mention Moshe? The arguments of Korach and his group was against Moshe and Aaron. So the Gemara should have said, which argument is not for the sake of heaven? The argument of Korach and Adato against Moshe and his brother. Right? But the Gemara did not say that because Moshe and his brother was all alone for the sake of heaven. You cannot include them in such a sentence. So the Gemara said, which machloket is Korach and Adato? But Korach and Adato are opponents of someone. What about that someone? That, that, that someone is not a factor here. He was always with Hashem and will always remain with Hashem. So why you say Korach and Adato? Because Korach and Adato are enemies. Each one of them joined the coalition for different reasons. The 250 leaders, they want to serve in the temple. That's their agenda. 
Datan and Aviram, they want to get a job, make money again, be, you know, respectful. Korach wants to be in charge. It's not enough. Everybody has a different direction. So as soon as they win the argument, God forbid, begin to kill each other. And that's what happened to this Rashaim in Israel. Once they formed the government and kick Bibi, from that moment they were busy for one year cursing each other, fighting with each other, putting each other down. What happened? A month ago you were willing to die for the cause. Yes. We had a mutual enemy. What is it like? Like Israel and the Arab countries and Iran. Before Iran were close to the bomb, the Arabs ate Israel, they ate the Jews. All the Arab countries were putting Israel on a ban. Every company wants to sell their merchandise in Israel, immediately the Arab calls them, oh, you want to sell in Israel? If you sell your product in Israel, all the Muslims in the world will not buy from you. What would you prefer? Six, seven million people in Israel to buy your product or one and a half billion Muslims? Immediately, they call Israel, I'm sorry, I cannot sell by you. The Saudi Arabia is very upset. We don't want to upset the bear. We do not want to deal with a mosquito when we have elephants and bears around. What is the mosquito going to bring us? That's how it was for decades. All of a sudden, the Arab got a little brain over here. They said, wait a minute, we keep fighting Israel, fighting Israel, and they got us nowhere. We have a much more dangerous enemy in our backyard. This Iranian Shiites monster, cruel like Nazis. If they will have a nuclear bomb, very possible they dump it on our head. Or, or they're going to say to the Saudis what, they, what the Saddam Hussein did to Kuwait, remember? Saddam, Saddam Hussein occupied Kuwait. Kuwait is a gold non-stop oil. Saddam Hussein occupied Kuwait. George Bush, the father, started the Gulf War. If Saddam Hussein, if they let him get away with that, the next thing he will occupy Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Saudi Arabia, all these countries within years. All the Middle East will be in Iran, Iraq. Saddam Hussein was eliminated, now Iran is the threat. But they are much more dangerous than Saddam Hussein. They are more powerful and much smarter. I want to remind you, the Iranians are not Arabs. If you check the history of the world, the Arabs contributed only two things to humanity. Only two things. One is great falafel and hummus. <laughs> and two, great music. They have very good music, if you understand about Middle Eastern music, and, uh, and great food. A lot of Middle Eastern food. What they deserve, they deserve to get. They're very good in food and in music. Did they ever invent any medicine, anything high-tech? Not, nothing. They don't even know to get their own oil from the land. That's how they are. Without the Russians and the Americans and other countries like France and others, they would never know how to turn the oil that in the ground into trillions of dollars every year. They would not know how to do it. The refineries, it's all foreign. It's unbelievable Hashem gave this uh, Ishmael a blessing that from nothing they became the richest people in the world. All these shakes, all of that. Why? From, from oil in the ground. Unbelievable. Imagine if they didn't have it. They would have nothing to sell. Nothing. Israel is, until now, they not have anything. But what? They use their brain to create money. Inventing this, inventing high techs, all the things you have in a car, smart cars, it's all made in Israel. All the accessories. By them, it's a different world. The Arabs say, we keep fighting Israel. Israel is growing, becoming a serious country, and we are still in the same place. Now we have these Iranians that are much more dangerous. If they have a nuclear bomb, that's the end of us. They will occupy the whole Middle East in a year. Look what they did in Syria. They got into Syria and Assad is afraid to deal with them. They actually, actually control Syria. And Lebanon, Hezbollah, that's it. And Hamas, they already, and Yemen also. 
They are occupying the Middle East. So the Arabs say, we have a mutual enemy, the Israelis and us. It's Iran. Let's be comrades there. So now Israel and the Arabs, the relationship is blooming. The question is, what's going to happen after the Israelis would wipe out Iran? There's no more threat. That's it. No more Iran. All the Ayatollahs will all be killed and the nation of uh, Iran, they will make a revolution, kick them out and make a democracy and tell America, come, destroy the nuclear, do whatever you want. We want to make Iran like Paris, like it used to be in the time of the Shah. We want to sell our oil. We are tired of the sanction. We want to be a European country like it used to be. Enough with this supporting Hamas. Enough with all the evil Ayatollahs. They slaughter them all, and that's it. That's one of the options that can happen in Iran. Once it will happen, immediately they become friends with Saudi, all of them. They all become brothers. That's the question what can happen to Israel. The Arab will kick us to the moon. Why? We don't need you anymore. Until now, what connected us? The fear from those evil Iranians. That's exactly what's happening over here. Korah has one agenda, and the 250 has a different agenda, and that time in Iran has its agenda. But now we have a mutual enemy, Moshe and Aaron. Let's eliminate them first. Then we begin to fight how to share the cake. That's how dirty people can be. When you don't have fear from God, you come always first. When you fear God, first God come, then you see, oh, what can I do? I cannot do. Okay. So Rabotai Chazal say, why they call it Machloket Korach Vadato? Because after they will win what they want to do, they begin to kill each other. That's why. There is a verse in uh, Proverbs 14, Chochmat, Chochmot Nashim, Banta Beta, Wisdom of a woman build a home. The event there, they are there, and there are some foolish, stupid women who destroy their home with their own hands. The Gemara say, who King Solomon is talking here about? Two kinds of wives: one that build the house with wisdom, and one that destroy the house with their own hand. So the Gemara say. Chochmat Nashim Banta Beta, this is the wife of On Ben Pelet. When they came to drag her husband into the argument, she did all kinds of things to make them run away. And Ivelet Beadea Tehersenu is the wife of Korach. The Gemara said that her name is actually Ivelet. Ivelet means Evil. Evil means Ksil. In Arabic, it means Ahbal. You know what it means, Ahbal? In Hebrew, it means Satum, or Stuma, the best. That's what it means. A person that is head is uh, not functioning. Tov. All night, Koach is talking Moshe, and now he's making fun. Listen to this, Abotai. You're going to be shocked from what you're about now. Oh, he's very charismatic. He has the power of, sweet, of speech like Hussein Obama. Empty head, but knows how to talk. The head inside has only one wire. If you open his head, cut it open, you see inside one wire. No brain, just one wire. What's this wire? You cut it, both ears will fall. <laughs> the, <laughs> the wire was holding the two ears. Why? Every decision he ever made is against the truth. Help Iran, help Palestinians, help Hamas, help the gays, decided that men will be women, women will be men. Destroyed America. Destroy the world. Hussein Obama. And his student, Sleepy Joe, came and finished the few leftover good pieces that Hussein left. Sleepy Joe came and finished the job. 
and destroyed America and there's no more America. Trump, as bad as he behaved, at least knew what's right and wrong. What's good for the country, what's bad. Illegal immigration, this, that, terrorism, all kinds of, of Muslim terrorists coming from all over the world, coming into America, building ISIS cells here. The Democrats, the liberals are blind. They don't see that the end of their children is coming. Finally, somebody normal came and screamed. They didn't like him. Why? Because he was, uh, you know, arrogant. He behaved with some ego and pride. They didn't like him. If he was more polite, speaking maybe with more respect to his enemies, maybe his words would be heard by more people. In the end, unfortunately, even some Republicans went against him. Why? Now I don't know anymore if he's good, if he will win the election. Until now, it was very good. Why? He did everything good for Israel, for the Jews, for the world, for America. Now he became an enemy with Netanyahu. He hates him. He said, Netanyahu disappointed me very much. Why? Because he called Sleepy Joe and congratulated him. But what option he had? It's already a week. He's a president already for a few days. The whole world is congratulating him. And Israel is supposed to be one of the friends of America. What do you that? Uh, I'm sitting and I'm not calling to say Mazal Tov. It's only going to make the situation worse. As it is, it's already worse with the Democrats. Why give them more ammunition against Israel? Why doesn't he understand? He doesn't understand politics. So, I listen to this story and we'll finish right here. All night, Korach is giving a speech to the nation. There was a widow. Listen to this story. When I finish the story, I want you to tell me what's wrong with that story. Please pay attention. There was a widow. And she had two daughters. And she was very, very poor. She's very poor. Even bread she didn't have. Pay attention to the details. Korach said that he had a neighbor, that she's a widow, she has two daughters, and she's very poor, that even bread she cannot eat. What did she do? She bought a field. I wonder with what money. She bought a field, and she's starting to put seeds in the ground, to plant seeds for fruits, for vegetables. Now maybe she's going to make a little living. Moshe came to her and say, oh, are you going to plow the ground? Make sure you don't use a donkey and an ox together. It's against the Torah. You have to use either two donkeys or two, two ox, oxes or bulls, whatever you call it. Why? Because each animal has their own strength. If you put the weak with the strong, the, the one will suffer. You have to put two of the same kind. That's what the Torah says. Tzar ba'alechaim. So make sure you don't mix between a, a donkey and a bull. Okay. Then she wanted to put seeds in the ground. Moshe showed up again. Be careful not to put two different kinds of seeds. It become mixture. You're not allowed to plant two different kinds of seeds in the same area. When finally it grew, Moshe showed up again. Don't forget, you have to leave some of it for the poor people. Leket, shichecha, pe'a, for the poor. In the corner of the field, what fell from your hand after you cut, you're not allowed to pick up. Top. Finally, when she has some wheat, that she's about to go and make some bread, Moshe said, wait, before you eat, you have to give my brother Aaron the Kohen, you have to give him a donation. The Kohanim has to get a donation. So you have to give me Amelevi, you have to give me 10%. From the 10% you give me, I have to give 10% to my brother, which will be eventually 1%, right? 10% of 10% is 1%. So don't forget about the Maaser. Until today we have Maaser. You have to give 10% of your net income. You must. Otherwise you steal from Hashem. That's when you'll be able to eat. The poor woman, she saw it's so complicated to make a living. Nobody gives a rest. She decided to sell the field. And with the money she sold the field, she bought two goats, two sheep. And thought maybe from the wool that will grow, 
I'm gonna make some sweaters for the children that they will have some warm winter, you know. When she came to cut the wool, Aaron showed up. Hey, don't forget, the first wool that you cut from the sheep, you have to give to the Kohen. That's what God says in the Torah. And when the first baby is born to the sheep, the male and female, she bought male and female, the firstborn is going as donation to the temple, to the Kohen. You have to give the firstborn. Tov. The widow, she didn't feel comfortable with so many donations, so much. So she decided to slaughter the, the sheep. As soon as she slaughtered them, Aaron showed up again. Hey, you have to give me the arm, you have to give me the chicks, and you have to give me the stomach. Those are the gifts that goes to the Kohanim every time you slaughter an animal. The woman say, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this. I give this donation to Hashem. I don't have it, and you won't have it. Say, oh, no, no, you're wrong, ma'am. If you make a donation to Hashem, that means all of it goes to Kohanim. Gets donation. Everything that goes to Hashem goes to the Kohanim. Korach said to the people, you see what kind of regime we have? They made sure to take care of their stomach real good. What Moshe takes, what's left, Aaron takes. You really think that that's what God said? But it's all written in the Torah. It's all verses. And they've got the Torah in a public event. It's not that there's no way to fake it. Now, this is the story, and everybody gets upset. That's right, that's right. Now, what's wrong with that story? Let's see who is clever here. Huh? What, what is wrong with that story? Nobody gets the point? I'll help you out. First of all, where did you have poor people in the desert? They all came with tons of jewelry that they took from the Egyptian. They are loaded with money. Everyone was stuffed with money and more. Plus the Egyptians that drowned in the Red Sea, they had tons of weeds and diamonds and all on the horses. So they, the nation of Israel very, very wealthy. With all the gold that they got, they built a temple. When they actually, <laughs> later on, had to do the Mishkan, they built it with all this gold. So they were all very, very rich. Second, what money you needed in the desert? It's not like here, you need to buy a house, you need five million dollars. Everybody lives out. And they have an air condition, and a cover from the sun, and the floor is getting smooth for them, and manna is falling every day, and they don't need to change their clothes for 40 years, because the Torah said that the clothes grew with the children, stayed according to their size. And the clothes never got ripped. Today, if a person said to his wife, on the day that they get married, honey, today we're getting married, but before we're getting married, before you say I do, I just want to make sure you understand. The deal is that I'm buying you one dress, and that's for 40 years. Next time we change your dress is when we be grandkids, grandparents. Like meaning now we are 20, when we be past 60, I'll buy you your second dress. What do you think? She will say, I do. She will give him such a kick, make him fly out of the wind. Get out of here, you lunatic, you psycho. Thank God for saving me for such a husband, husband. So I don't understand. Hashem is bragging in the Torah. For 40 years I did not make you change your clothes. I did laundry for you with the clouds driving. I made sure it doesn't get ripped. Even children that had clothes, it grew up with them. Meaning a woman wore the same dress for 40 years. And I did not bother her going shopping and sewing her clothes. Because you didn't have a need. It stayed brand new for 40 years. But mentally, one woman can wear the same dress 40 minutes. 
Forget 40 years. Today, 40 minutes. You don't believe me, but I'll tell you an unbelievable story. I, one time, met a woman, Israeli woman. Back then, she was close to 60. Today, she's probably close to 80 already. She was working for one of the richest Jewish families in the world. They own the biggest chemical company in the world. Ah, they have buildings all over the world. They're billionaires, worth more than $30 billion, and they own the company with no stockholders. They own it. You know how rich they are? And they had a boy and a girl, the grandson and the granddaughter. And I don't have to tell you how they grew up on the on right. There's a place called right on the water. They had a huge mansion over there. And she is their nanny. She raised them. And she got my, uh, she went to the Israeli parade. And they do Yom Atzmaut, Independence Day in uh, Fifth Avenue. And w back then I came up with my cassette, video cassette 25 years ago of uh, Divine Information. That's the name of the website. And guys used to go with boxes, 50 video cassette. It used to be very big. It happened, they used to give them out. And she picked up one of them. It's in Hebrew with English subtitles. She watched it at home. There was no CDs and DVDs yet, and no USBs, and none of the things we have, no iPhone, no internet, no Facebook. This is way before all of that. There was video cassettes and audio cassettes, small ones. <laughs> they gave American kids an audio cassette with two holes. They, they thought it's bad knuckles. They said, I don't see anything. <laughs> they didn't know what it is with the tape inside. Anyway, so she became Shomer Shabbat. And then she contacted me and we started to get in, you know, in touch. And uh, one time she said to me, they are doing a special evening in Lincoln Center. There's a fancy hotel in Manhattan in a Lincoln Center, I think is Mandarin Hotel, something like that, I don't remember the name. I think they own the hotel or something like that. So they're doing a special evening because they're donating, I don't know, 100 million or whatever the amount was, huge amount, to the Holocaust Museum in Washington. They were opening a museum, so they give a big donation, they make a special evening. And they would want you to come to pay respect. Now, what do I have to do with this kind of event? Of the rich and famous, but not just rich. Rich, rich. It's not for me. I don't feel belong there with all this fake, you know. But first, I owe them a lot of gratitude. Why? Because they were very hungry. Meaning they buy non-stop clothes. So they go to the store, they buy agents, each one $150, $200, and they don't wear it. They buy clothes, dresses, $800, $500, and they never wear it. Uh, unlimited amount of money. So what happened? Every month she called, I have a lot of things. I go with my minivan, she throw all their stuff in, I go to the yeshiva, I give it to all the guys. The religious people cannot wear their clothes, but they can go back to all these fancy stores, and get credit. So, <laughs> some of the dresses were really nice. So you had an avrech in yeshiva who makes $500 a month salary, and his wife wearing a $3,000 dress. And nobody understands, how is it possible? Why? From their leftover. Everyone was eating from their leftover. For a few years. In unbelievable. I said, listen, one of the f principles of Judaism is gratefulness. If you're not a grateful person, you cannot be a kosher Jew. So I had to go. So I went there. I put the car in the parking lot. <laughs> you need a mortgage for the parking lot over there. <laughs> so as soon as I arrived there, I see their driver. The driver that drive all their fancy cars. Many times he used to bring the stuff. When I couldn't go and they had too many stuff and they wanted to get rid of it, he would drive to us in Monsi and bring it. So we became a little friendly. So it's from Portugal, some, you know. I see him standing by the circle, by the entrance to the hotel. 
I say, oh, thank God, I at least have someone to talk to. Otherwise, who would I talk to here? Yeah, I'm the only religious person there. So when I saw him, I was happy. At least I'm going to have somebody to sit next to me. He said, come, let's go together. He said to me, no, I cannot enter the event. So I said, so why are you standing over here? He said, I'm watching the car. I said, why, they don't put the car in the parking lot? He said, no, they need the car right by the door of the hotel. So, and I see a big limo like this, big uh, SUV limo. I said, I said well, why do they need the car over here? He said, because she has to change her clothes. I said, what do you, what do you mean change her clothes? It, so he said to me, he opened, he said, look, every hour she comes down and put the different uh, gowns. Meaning in one evening, because, you know, they take pictures and stuff, I don't know what's the idea over here, that she's going to show that in one evening she changed three different gowns. <laughs> and Hashem said to the Jewish nation, you see, I saved you from all this nonsense. Four years, one dress, and you're all happy. What do we learn from here? that all of us are mentally sick. If the creator of the world is bragging about the fact that women did not need to change their clothes for 40 years and didn't have the headache of worry about changing clothes, that means that is the truth. And the fact that no one would agree to wear uh, the same dress twice, forget about 40 years straight, twice to two different events, it shows that everything we live for, it's all show off. All fake, all pride, all ego, and all is rotten from the beginning to the end. Because a down-to-earth person doesn't ever care what he wears as long as it's not rape. <laughs> What's the problem? Who am I impressing? What is this show off? <sighs> so Rabotai, First question, who was poor? What's that? Who was poor? No one was poor there. So what Korach said, I have a neighbor that she was very poor. Second, where exactly she bought a field from? Who owned any field in the desert? Nobody had any field. Third, who has to plow the ground? You have bread falling express to your hand. Why do you need to put seeds in the ground? Why do you need to grow anything? Third, all the laws of Kohanim and Levi'im only apply when they enter Israel, meaning 40 years later. All the speech that Korach gave, not one detail over there applies. It's all lies. And everybody knew that. They, this is not applying to us, all these Kohanim, Levi'im, Asrot, wheat, that, feed, living for the poor, it's all in Israel. Not in the desert. Everybody knew that this whole story is a lie. This whole story was hypothetically speaking. Hypothetically speaking. Look what can happen to us one day. This is the leadership you want. And everybody started to get crazy. Just like Hitler took the Germans. They were busy with classical music, with art. All of a sudden, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, they steal all the money, they make all the money, they control Germany. Soon they're going to make a revolution here like they did in Russia. Drove them crazy. The next thing, 80% of them became monsters. Kill the Jews, dead to the Jews. Same thing in Iran. The Jews live relatively beautifully with the Muslims in Iran in the time of the Shah. Friends, this, that. Who many came in a few years, turned them all into anti-Semite monsters. Not that they didn't have monsters before. They had. But those who were not uh, care about the Jews, for good or bad, all of a sudden brainwashed them in such a way. That's how people are. It's like sheep. The sheep all follow the first one. One is going, everybody follows. So Rabotai, in the end Korach say, my neighbor died from hunger. How come now one person got up and said, let me ask you a question, you're the richest guy in the world. 
You couldn't give some food to that widow, you couldn't give him $10,000, you have brilliant. You're the richest man, Ashir Kakorach. You saw this widow, is dying, doesn't have bread for her children. You watching this whole process, how she buy a field, and she sell it, and she buy sheep, and she slaughtered the sheep, and in the end she left with nothing, and she died, and you didn't do anything about it? We should execute you, not, me, not make you our leader. Well, there was not one honest person. Now one Jew got up and said, excuse me, Korach, with all due respect, if that story would happen one day, like you're so afraid, why wouldn't you come and open your pocket and take a few thousand dollars and help her out? Buy her 20, 30 sheep, buy her something, give her some money for food. What's the problem? Isn't it the whole Torah is a charity? The idea is nobody listens, nobody cares. Once one person begins to brainwash the people, in the end, everybody follow. One person was walking on the street on Purim, and he was very happy. His friend asked him, why are you so happy today? I mean, Purim, Purim, but you are very happy and smiling. He said, I found a superb poor person for Purim, to give him tzedakah. Purim is mitzvah to give tzedakah to the poor. I found poor the oraita. <laughs> he said, where is he? Let me also go give him. Because they didn't want to give rich people. They wanted to find a real poor person. Sometimes you can't find. You live in a rich area. And many people say to me, Rabbi, I don't know any poor person. Can you give to one of the people in Yeshiva? Poor him, this, Hanukkah. There's a lot of poor people in Yeshiva. They sit and learn. They don't walk. They need money. Okay. So he said to me, where, where is he? He said, no, no. I'm not telling you who he is. <laughs> I want to keep him for next year. <laughs> I want to make sure I have him for next year. If everyone would run to give him, he's not going to be poor anymore. Where would I find another poor person like him next year? So he's willing for the poor person to suffer all year that next poor him he will have to give charity to. This is the way we are. Rabbi, after this and this, I would like to give. I would like to. Why don't you give now? Who knows if you're going to be here a month later? This is the way the Satan is. And Namash will finish with this. Rav Dester says something amazing. And Namash will finish here. The rest will continue tomorrow. We have a general, very important foundation rule. The name of God will always be sanctified in the world. It Kadesh Motamit Baolam. Forever. The person has two options in front of him. One, או שיעשה על ידו, או שיעשה על גבו. Translation. Or he will be done by you, or he will be done through you. There is a difference. By you, or through you. What's the difference? It's depend on your choice, the choice you made. When Elijah the prophet, 2,600 years ago, came to the Carmel mountain to debate the 450 false prophets that were butchering Israel with their nonsense and their rotten ideology and heresy. Just like today, all these heretic speakers are everywhere you go. And hard to believe what's going on, all these university rabbis that modify the whole truth of the Torah. <laughs> Eliyahu Anavi was one righteous, correct prophet, and all of them were all fake. And they took two cows, and they're about to slaughter the cows, and to see fire will fall from heaven on this cow, on their cows. So... He told them, here is your cow, here is my cow, you prepare your cow, and cry to Hashem, maybe he would listen to your prayers, and I will do what I have to do, and we'll see who God chose, you or me. You are 450, and I'm one. Eliyahu took his cow, and the cow went to the, close to the altar, and the other cow didn't want to go. 
They try to move him, he doesn't want to go. He resists. They try to push him. The wicked prophets, he doesn't move. Eliyahu came to the cow and said, I'm asking you to go with him. I know why you don't want to go. Why? Because you do not want to be slaughtered on the altar of these wicked people. They're all idol worshippers and fakers. But if you will go, the name of Hashem will be sanctified through you. Through you. Right? No. By you, not through you. By you. It will, the name of Hashem will be, done, will be sanctified by you, meaning by your choice to go. Why the cow didn't want to go? It didn't want the name of Hashem to be sanctified through him. He wanted the name of Hashem to be sanctified by him, meaning the other cow is exactly what is called by Navi, by Elijah. So the, when the fire will fall on the altar of Eliyahu, thanks to that cow, everyone will know which side God is. But the other cow will not get any fire. It will not be burned, meaning it's not going to be a problem. It's nothing. The one who will be actually sitting and only be there, the cow of Eliyahu. There's not going to be fire on me, so... I do not want to participate in such a thing. But Eliyahu told him, no, you are wrong. You should go anyway. Why? Because the fact, the fact that you will be on the altar and the fire will not fall on you from heaven, right? Many people will understand here who is right and who is wrong. So without you, something like this wouldn't happen. So by you walking with them, the name of Hashem will not sanctify through you. It will be sanctified by you. What does it mean through you? I'll give you an example. A man, he wanted to kill Mordechai. He prepared the tree. What happened in the end? They hung him over there. A man wanted to do Kiddush Hashem? No. By the fact that they hung a man, there was Kiddush Hashem. That they saw the miracle of God. The name of Hashem was sanctified through a man. Not by a man. If a man would choose to do Kiddush Hashem, then he would get the merit that thanks to him that was Kiddush Hashem, meaning he chose to do Kiddush Hashem. Sometimes you choose to do Hilul Hashem. But when Hashem punishes you, Kiddush Hashem comes to the world, although you meant opposite. That's what it means. Through you or by you. By you is when you actually chose. Through you is nobody ask you. You wanted to do bad, but we will turn it into good. And good Kiddush Hashem would come to the world, although you resisted it. But we don't care about what you want to do, and we don't care about your choice. We care about what Hashem wants. The question is, will the wicked person or, or people will get a credit for that? that Kiddush Hashem was done by their punishment? That's the question. Kiddush Hashem was done by Eliyahu, by the cow, the water, fire came. Okay, so it was done through him, by him, I should say. But the other, the other sides, because they lost the argument, and later he killed them all. He executed them all. He didn't give them a job in a Spanish and Portuguese school. After everybody saw that they're all fakers, all university garbage speakers modified the Torah reform, what happened? He executed all of them. Rivers of blood was on the Carmel Mountain. No one was politically correct faker back then, like today. Today, leave them alone. They mean well. It's a different generation. You know all these excuses. Back then, it was black and white. It's either black or it's either white. There's no gray areas. Make a decision. It's either allowed or it's not allowed. It's the truth or it's false. It's what God wants or it's what he hates. Today everything became blurry. That's why there's so many naive people. They follow these fakers. Sometimes people innocently, I'm listening to that speaker. 
is speaking about you should love yourself and forgive yourself and everything you do, you should be proud of what you do. I say, excuse me, this is all against the Torah. If you murder, you should be proud of what you do. If you steal every day, you should be proud of what you do. If you walk naked on the street as a woman, you should be proud and forgive yourself and compliment yourself that you're Machtiat Arabim. Who told you this nonsense? That speaker, I, I go to Google, I put his name, I see a model. <laughs> no, no, that's me. Oh, went a lot to the gym, jail, this, that. What's the connection between this guy and Torah? Nothing. He wants to be a coach. There is a goy coach. What's his name? Anthony something? What's the name of that coach that everybody follows? No. <laughs> you don't know. There's some coach here, some goy. He speaks about these things. You have to love yourself, you have to do this, you have to feel good. You have to... Excuse me. We are not a coach here. This, we are teaching Torah. What's allowed and what's not allowed. What Hashem loves and what He hates. That's it. This is not a fan club. Make everyone afraid. The gay, the prostitute, the thief, the murderer. The idol worshiper, make everyone feel good. Make them all love themselves. For what? For rebelling against Hashem? For murdering babies, making an abortion? For voting Democrats to destroy the Torah or what's left from it? For making a party in a shul that it looks more like a bar than a synagogue? That's when they should be proud of themselves. <sighs> Rabotai. Paro did not want the Jewish nation to go. In the end, Hashem buried him. Kiddush Hashem was by him or through him? Through him. Haman, through him. The 454th prophet, Kiddush Hashem came through him, through them. Korach was buried alive. The ground opened up. He fell down. 250 leaders, Datan and Aviram, the children of Korach in the last minute repented. They did tshuva. They were not, they didn't, they didn't die. They, what, that's what confused Korach all alone. He saw in his vision, look at what level he was. He's carrying the Aaron, the Ark. He has a vision. He can see the future. He sees a, an image what's going to be. And he sees that Samuel, the prophet, is going to be his grandson coming from him. He says, it cannot be that I'm wrong. Why? Such a wrong man came out of me, will come out of me, and I'm going to lose the army. It cannot be. In the end, it came from, the, from his children, not from him. How many people were buried alive? That's the last question for today. Who knows? Huh? How many people? So we just said Korach, Datan, and Aviram, and 250. That's 253. Is that all? Who else? The family of Korach, another 50 people. So more than 300 people died. Tomorrow, I'm going to describe why they died in such a way. And what happened after they died? Remember, it's a serious holocaust here. After the leaders, all the leaders are drowning in the ground in a, in a horrible death. They get burned and buried while they are burning. It's terrible. Such an impact on the nation. What would you expect the rest of the nation of Israel to do? To condemn Moshe and Aaron? or to fall on their face and bow down to them and say, we'll never make another beep. God is the God and you are his messengers. The Gemara says, We get people, even they see the fire of hell waiting for them, they still don't repent. After what, they, what happened, they started to complain. And Hashem sent a pandemic, a plague, a pandemic. How many died? 14,700 people. 
14,000, almost 15,000, plus the 300, 15,000 people. In one minute, in one day, a big disaster. Instead of coming to Moshe and put the head down, we saw it and we listened to this clown for all the bad things he was talking. We should have never questioned you. What did they say? You killed them. It's all your fault. In life, Hashem gives you a few opportunities to fix your mistake. First time, you should have never cooperated with Korah. To begin with, it was interesting. Now you see what was the end of them. You see where is Moshe and you see where they are. Now you have to wake up and scream, I'm sorry. How did I take the wrong side? Forgive me. Not only did they not regret, they came to Moshe and said, it's all your fault. Look what you did. The righteous has to be blamed for the death of the wicked who decided to fight him. That's a twisted mind. That's like today. Today with the fakeness and the politically correct speakers. Admire the wicked and cursing the righteous. There was one from Long Island when Hashem destroyed the gays of Pittsburgh for bringing a baby from Brazil, making a Brit Mila on Shabbat to a goy. Everybody comes with a car, two men adopting a baby, destroying the baby's life. Poor goy, this kid from Brazil, will grow with two cycles. And when they do the Brit, on Shabbat. It's not allowed to do Brit on Shabbat. You're only allowed to do Brit on Shabbat if the baby was born on Shabbat, and if he's Jewish, and if he's healthy, and everything's fine, then you have to do it on Shabbat. If he wasn't born on Shabbat, you cannot do the Brit on Shabbat. If he was born Caesarean, let's say there was a problem to the mother, life risk. The ambulance took her to the hospital, they opened her stomach and took the baby out on Shabbat. There was no other way, otherwise she'll die. Do you do Brit Milan next Shabbat? No, because it was artificially delivered. It wasn't a natural birth. You have to do it the following Sunday. Now I'll have to break Shabbat. These guys bring it. They don't do Brit Milan for going. Making Vachot Baruch Hashem, Okeinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kiddushan, Ritzvot Achniso, Bebrito Shel Avraham Avinu. Abraham Avinu wants to vomit when he see you dirty people, how you behave. So what happened? Hashem sent some Nazi, Nazi racist with the machine. I mean, they got into the, remember that Pittsburgh a few years ago? They started to shoot, I think, killed 11 of them. One of the only righteous rabbi said to his community, I don't allow any one of you to read Tehillim for this time. We're not going to kiss up to this Rishayim for rebelling against Hashem, and now we're going to kiss up to them, like this kind of holy people. Another one say, they're holy. Holy? Since when the race became holy? Sodom and Gomorrah. The people of Sodom were holy. If they were holy, why Hashem killed them all? Why they get death penalty by stoning and cut for the soul from the afterlife permanently? Holy people don't get such punishment. Why are you twisting the whole truth of the Torah? The answer is because it's a university rabbi. So know the difference between a real rabbi who learned the great yeshivot and someone who became a rabbi university academic. It's nothing to do with holiness. So to the holy rabbi who condemned the wicked, he called him Sitracha, meaning Satan. And to the gays, he called holy. And people asking me, why is in your blacklist? You really, really asking me such a question? One guy from the university, he's a good boy, Persian boy. He said to me, why is he in your blacklist? He has a community. I said, so what? He said, but can you tell me why is he in your blacklist? I understand this one, that one, but why is he? I said, he's, in my opinion, the worst. I said, why? He called the holy, one of the holiest rabbis in America, he called him Sitracha, garbage, and he called the gays holy, and you're asking me if he's normal or not? Can you rely on one thing he teach? If his mind is so twisted and so corrupted, how do you even ask? He called Moshe 
Just like the, we say when we drink and pour him, when we drink and pour him, we have to be drunk to the level that we don't know who is blessed and who is scarce. Baruch Mordechai and Arur Aman. Meaning you're so drunk that they ask you, tell me who was the good guy in the story, Mordechai or Aman? I don't know, leave me alone, I'm in a different world. So he made, God forbid, say, Baruch Haman and Chen Chasu Shalom Arur Mordechai. Maybe so drunk to twist. I never met one person that is so drunk that he won't know the difference between Haman and Mordechai. But assuming, let's say it will happen, we won't blame him because he drank. Put him, you drink. But this guy didn't drink. He was very alert. For him, the gays are holy, and the holy rabbi who goes twice a day to the mikveh and gave his life for the Torah, and his 50 years rabbi, and made hundreds of family Baalei Tshuva, and watch his eye completely from not looking at anything bad for over 30 years since I know him. He called him Sitra Achra, and to these filthiest people on earth, he called them holy. Just like coming and say, Korach is holy, and Moshe Chaz Shalom is not. I don't want to say something else. And then you ask, are you allowed to make him your rabbi? You're asking me such a question, and that means you're not normal. I'm sorry. It's very simple by me. It's either the truth or it's the opposite. There's no in between. When someone comes to you and says, Mordechai is bad and Haman is good, Moshe is bad and Korach is good, Eliyahu is bad and the 450 fakers are good, like many speakers out there today that are on my blacklist, one of them made it even worse. He made a whole book against Hashem. I didn't ask to be born. Meaning, it's your fault that we are wicked. You have no right to tell us what to do and to punish us. Complete heretic. Like, you never saw in your life such thing. Yeah. As long as he made himself a nice look like Santa Claus, he comes. And a lot of fools follow the beard. They think that the beard make the person holy. If that's the case, send them to India to see how the Indians drink the urine of the cow without making shea kol bitvaro. They fight. You have to see how they fight. I have an Indian guy, Tzadik. Mahuch Hashem, he ran away from there. He ran to Canada. But he was telling me, my father and brother bring the cow into the living room of our house and they bow down to the cow and you have to see how they fight to drink the urine of the cow. People buy it in the pharmacy. They believe the cow is holy. That's idol worshippers. You understand, Rabotai, what, we, what world we live in? And they all have, some of them have very nice beard and turbans. Turbans. If you would put uh, some Hebrew words on top of them, people would think they are the Mekubalim of Baghdad, by the way they look. After they see how they push and fight and bow down to the cow, they'll have to think again where they're from. Bottom line, what I'm saying to you is the outside look doesn't add anything. You don't know anymore who the person is, doesn't mean how he looks. You have to check what comes out of his mouth. What he admires and what he hates. And based on that, you know if his ideology is kosher or not. Don't, yeah, they, they have a saying is, don't look at the vase from the outside. Look from the inside, meaning look what's inside. What are you looking at? Some flowers from the outside. It's shallow. Inside is empty. Sometimes the face is very pretty, but inside there is only straw. Like Hussein Obama with the wire, he may look good from the outside. Or Sleepy Joe, very nice looking guy. But what's inside? Everything came out of his mouth is like a level of a three years old ch child from kindergarten. The opposite of every common sense. Men become women, women become men, bathroom for all kinds. You, Olympic Games, a man became a woman, now he wants to run in the Olympic. Come on, what's going on over here? <laughs> the other women say, it's not fair, he has an advantage. No, he doesn't, he takes hormones. 
איי, 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 כן, take this anymore, enough is enough. ברוך אדוני לעולם, אמן ואמן.